As actors, we get to rely on scripts to tell us what to do. Like when to slap someone across the face and when to let someone slap you. But we don't need a script to tell us to help someone in need. The Psych Foundation was founded to do just that, to help performers with life's unscripted moments and to give back to our communities. Over the past decade, the SAG Foundation has given millions in financial and medical assistance to SAG after performers and their families. Last year, more than 25,000 union performers attended over 500 SAG Foundation Q&As, seminars, and workshops. And SAG Foundation book pals read to over 60,000 children in schools every month nationwide. Do you know how much SAG after members pay for all these resources and programs? Zero. Zero. Zilch. Nada. Do you know how much of our union dues go to the SAG Foundation? Zero. 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 The SAG Foundation is a nonprofit that relies solely on donations, so it is vital that those who are able to help give what they can. And you've been giving since the SAG Foundation was founded in 1985. I love 1985. Out of Africa. The Color Purple. The Goonies. The Cosby Show. Family Ties. The Golden Girls. What? So many truly fantastic performances since then. We have a wonderful history and a beautiful tradition of being there for one another. If you need help, it's here for you. And if you can help, please give. Like every great production, we are at our best when we all act together. 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 So please, act now. Thank you guys again for coming. My name is Dennis Baker. I'm the Life Raft Program Director. Thank you for those in the audience. Thank you for those on the live stream. How did you guys like that promo video? Pretty good? Yeah, that was pretty fun, wasn't it? A couple of more things before we jump in. We are trying to be social media conf um, conscious here at the SAC Foundation. So we're on the, all the major social media platforms, twitter.com slash SAC Foundation, facebook.com slash SAC Foundation. Two things about those is those are great places to like and follow because we put the events on the website before the email goes out. And all our veterans know as soon as that email goes out, things fill up fast, right? Can I get a yup? Can I get a huh? Yeah? So, um, so check those because sometimes we'll send a tweet out or send a message on Facebook. Hey, the events on the, um, on the website sign up before the email goes out. Also bookmark the website and you can check it every day because events sometimes come up on a daily if not weekly basis. Um, also you can follow me, Dennis Baker, I'll send stuff out in the foundation as well. Um, lastly, the YouTube page, youtube.com slash SAC Foundation. There you can watch all the live streams and the archive videos. There's over two and a half years of life raft panels up on the YouTube page. Everything from casting directors to taxes, and everything in between, agents, the whole nine yard. So we ask that you go there. If there's something that was said tonight that you missed notes-wise, you can check it there. Share any information that you liked about any of the videos that are on there, and it's free to everyone. So you to what I call pre-union members and everyone in between. So please check that out and get the word out, because we are still kind of small and we're trying to get the word out as much as possible. Make sense? Awesome. Last thing I'm gonna say is we are a nonprofit. Grants and donations is how we function. So when you do um, have a greater financial situation in some places, we ask that maybe you um, pitch some money our way, $5, $10. Every seat costs us about $15. So depending on how often you come, it's a pretty great deal for maybe $5 a month or $10 a month. There's a donate button on the website. You can give it to one of the volunteers. You can give it to me. There's sometimes a box on the right. Also, um, part of what the SAC Foundation does is financial assistance. So if you are really, truly in need and are having a um, really tough time, call the office. There's some steps to go through to maybe get some assistance. So that's there for you as well, just like the video said. So I'm excited for tonight. We have a great panel. Um, we're gonna get started by having them kind of introduce themselves and give them um, a little bit about themselves and then we'll jump in. So, Ryan, you wanna start? Sure, hi, I'm Ryan Basham. I'm an Aquarius. Um, I, <laughs> I, uh, I'm a film and TV producer, freelance, and uh, a life and business coach. I, uh, I develop film and TV and I also, well, I coach creative professionals, but I use creative as a, very broad term. To me, someone who created a tech startup is, is, that's creative, that's incredibly creative. So I work with creative people on creating the results they want in their careers, but also in all of their life, not just that one domain. Sounds great. Um, I'm Una Mekas. I um, have been an actress for, oh, thanks. <laughs> uh, 
I don't know, over 10 years. And then uh, recently, in the last few years, I moved into directing and writing. So now I'm a triple threat, but I don't sing and I don't dance. I, I do, but not that kind of triple threat. Um, and uh, I guess I'm a goal setter. Um, yeah, so that's, that's a little bit about me. And my baby will probably be in an Aquarius, hopefully. Good. So <laughs> that's all I have about Aquarius. Ryan is a great name. It's a girl. Still. Oh, right. Good to Hi, I'm Daisy Swan, and uh, I'm a career coach. I've been in Los Angeles doing this work for over 20 years, and um, I work with individuals of all ages and all different careers. And of course, being in Los Angeles, I've worked with a lot of entertainment professionals, either trying to get in the business or trying to get out of the business. So. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's been a, a really great ride, and I, I love what I do, and I'm really happy to be here with everybody. Thank you. Hi, everybody. My name is Ben Whitehair, and I'm an actor, and uh, I also am a social media nerd. Um, I, I teach social media particularly to actors, but again, anybody, anybody really, it, it can be beneficial. And... I also uh, am the chair of the Next Gen Performers Committee here at, uh, at SAG-AFTRA, and I'm very involved with that and the union, and I also have a, a business background. I started a company that helped out-of-state students get in-state tuition and save about $30 million on college, and so I have uh, a lot of background in, in terms of what we're talking about, in terms of strategizing and strategic planning and goal setting and all those very exciting things we'll be talking about. Great, so we're gonna jump right in. I think that um, obviously this is a full house, so these people get it, so, but maybe some people live stream are like, what's this goal setting thing about? I'm gonna start with Ben down there since his W and he was last seating. I'll have you go first this time. <laughs> um, why is goal setting important to you? Why is it something that you are active in talking about, working on it yourself? Why, why is it something people need to maybe be conscious about and to have it on the radar? I think, I mean, the core of it is having the life of your dreams, really, like whatever it is that you want, the, the most supportive way to get there, I think involves everything that we're gonna be talking about tonight around actually, A, being clear on what it is that you want, <clears throat> excuse me, A, being clear it is on what you want, and then B, figuring out how you're actually going to get there. And obviously we're gonna get into some more specifics, but for me specifically, like when I came out to LA, Every year, uh, I would, I'm from Colorado, and I would go Broncos, by the way. Um, yeah. Uh, so every year, I would <clears throat> drive back to Colorado with my, one of my best friends, Robin. And he and I would use the drive back to Colorado, which is about 16 hours, and look back at our last year, do a review, what worked, what didn't work, all those types of things. And then when we drive back out to Los Angeles, we came up with sort of a, a, a system of creating our vision and goals for the coming year. And so we've been doing that now for the last five or six years. And I've, to answer your question specifically, the reason why it's important, I, like I've watched it in my own life and I've watched myself actually accomplish the things that I wanted to accomplish. I actually have the things that I wanted to have in my life, whether it's related to my career or relationships or my family. And, and I can track it, I can know, I can look back, I can say five years ago I said I wanted this and, and I have it or I don't and figure out what then is, is in the gap. But so really, you know, the core of it is figuring out what systems and processes and stuff work for you so that you can actually have the things you want. Great. Um, Daisy, there's a lot of terminology around this. Um, we're going to, I wrote things like vision, goal, action items. Is, what terminology do you use with clients? Is it similar? Is it a little different? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, well, listening to what you were saying made me think about, again, <laughs> think about this. Um, I think it's really important to have a vision. And uh, that's generally how I do my process is like, I, I'm such a relationship person. And so I always think about what kind of people do I want to be around? Um, when I read books, I think, do I like this person? Would I want to be around this person? Um, I read a lot of nonfiction, so um, I have a lot of idols out there who write great books. And um, 
or um, with my clients. I really want them, oftentimes I ask them to do vision boards, maybe many of you have done those, but I, I think being able to really see what it is that you want in your life is so valuable, and that really keeps me personally on track uh, with what I'm, I'm hoping for. And once you have a vision, of course, then then you can know what are those steps that, that need to um, come along and what do I need to learn? Uh, because I'm working with people in their career so often, uh, I think it's so important to be thinking about, you know, what are, what are the things that will continue to enliven me? And because that's what it's really all about is where are you most alive, right? And, and what will bring you closer to what you want? So th that's a little bit. Great. Does anyone else, do you guys have different terminology that you guys use? How, what terminology uh, comes out of I never use hope or wish, yeah. ever. Uh, hope is a ship that sank. Um, I, uh, I never use don't. It, to get a little woo-woo, the universe doesn't hear don't. I don't want to be poor. What you are creating is poor. What you're focusing on is poor. So. 100% of the time, it's always in the affirmative. What do I want? What do I want to create? And I would say, yeah, I, I, that's like a secret thing, but um, I mean, from the secret, you know, the, the book or the movie. Um, it can be our secret, too. Yeah. <laughs> the, the secret's out. Um, but that, I think. that really does work. And when, um, if you concentrate more on the positive things, you also find that you open your scope a little bit too um, because like staying in this little focused negative tunnel just doesn't really do any good when you're just focusing on what you don't have um, and uh, <coughs> I visualize a lot I have never done a, a, a vision board oh, really I fun. everybody says I should do it and I've had it on one of my action lists <laughs> for like years and never done one and I used to kick myself over it like you know, every January I would say, I'm going to do a vision board and it's going to change my life. But what I realized is I was doing a vision board in a different way. So, um, it, like my language is more visualization. So I will actually mm -hmm. sit and meditate. Um, for me, meditation is a really big thing. Um, and visualize what I want. Mm -hmm. um, and then I use I will um, instead of I need to or I want to or I have to. Um, I will is really powerful. Because you can visualize yourself doing it, and that's like half the battle right there, if you can see yourself in the place where you want to be. Actually, and I can speak to that. Um, I would say about four years ago, actually it may be longer now, um, I was really thinking about where I wanted my next office to be. And I, I could really see, this was before the whole co-working thing, where there are you know, companies all working together. And I just kept seeing this kind of warehouse space, brick walls, and there's not many brick walls. I'm from New York where there are more brick walls. <laughs> and I just kept seeing this space that I really wanted to be able to work in. And it took about four to five years till I found it. But when I found it, it was like, yeah, this is the place. So that's, that's where I work now. So I think it really works. I'm curious, how many people have made a vision board? Uh. Awesome. Um, one of the things that I'm hearing us already talking about is how important being specific is. And for me, I, in terms of the actual language, I, I delineate vision and goals. I personally look at goals as something that I have direct control over. So for example, like my vision might be to book a guest star on NCIS. I can't like go out and do that tomorrow, right? Like, okay, I'm gonna book a guest star today. What I can do are a million things that would lead me to that vision, right? So I'll have that vision. I'll have NCIS on my vision board. I'll be clear, I imagine myself on set and what that experience would be like. But then in terms of, okay, how do I actually get there? That's for me when I look at then the actual goals, which are things that I believe are actually actionable. So whether that's getting new headshots or a new demo reel or going to a networking event or a SAC Foundation thing or the million things I could do that might support me on the way to the vision I have, that's when I get into the, the actual goal setting, what are the next, next action items and breaking it down very specifically so I can start tracking it and making sure that I'm making progress. 
Well, and to that point, I think it's, it's important to be clear and being specific when you set a, a goal you know, or create your vision, being specific is crucial, but also not being attached to what it looks like when you get there is crucial too. Yes. A lot of people have a very specific idea that they write down and they look at every day about what they want something to look like, and that's valuable. I do think that's valuable, and I, I do that. But also, not being attached to what it looks like when you get there, because you may get there and discover that what ends up happening is way more what you wanted than you knew you wanted. Yeah, things morph. Um, I use, you know, I, I, I also think that you have to constantly, constantly be updating your goal. Mm -hmm. So like you said, like, even beyond being specific, like, be specific only about that next actionable item, and then where does that one go to? Like maybe you'd call up some office that you didn't even expect to get a response from, and they're so incredibly helpful, and somebody says, well, you know, I can mentor you, and then where does that lead? That maybe leads somewhere completely different than you wanted to, but um, I hope that wasn't too vague of a, an example, but um, th things morph, and you have to be able to change with them. Um, I'm curious, for you guys, what different areas, maybe categories is a term we can use, that you have your vision and your goals? So maybe career is one, but what other areas of your life have you created um, vision and goals around? I'm super specific about mine. I have, I think it's like about a dozen that I look at and when I do my annual review and everything. Um, so yes, yeah, certainly career is one. I'll then say maybe work, which may be a way that I'm bringing in income that is sort of separate than the career I'm wanting, right? Maybe you have a thrival job. Relationships, which again is broad in sort of friendships, romantic relationships, et cetera. Family, uh, service, but in whatever way that looks, community service, giving back. Finances, and you can even break that down into you know giving, saving, uh, other goals in, in with that. Travel is one of the domains that I, uh, I continue to visit every year. And then lifestyle, I look at sort of my habits, you know, if it's that I want to be meditating every day or, you know, the way that I'm managing my life as the CEO of my own acting company. Um, and then health and fitness as a domain. I think that's about all of them. Ben has a really, and I'm going to, he won't talk about it himself, but Ben created this really cool template where he has like these domains that he gave me and I use it every year. All of those domains, I don't remember what all of them are. I have to go back and look at it when I want to know, but Ben shared that with me and it's like, you know, I, I didn't realize and I think it's easy to forget there's so much to life and it's easy for me to focus on one or two things. I'm single and I want to be in a relationship. I desperately want to be making six figures or seven figures or whatever that is and uh, or whatever those couple of things are and then I forget that it's important to me to be of service. That really fills me up uh, spiritually. It's important to me to to foster relationships with friends and so on and so forth. So it's important to take a comprehensive look at your life. Yeah, and I, I work with clients all the time on all the different areas of their lives. So, And I've, I've done it myself, and I know the value of really looking at these different areas and then breaking each area down into, say, three actionable um, items that I'm going to attend to. And like, for example, because I'm um, a solopreneur, I work alone, right? And sometimes it can get kind of lonely. So at, at one point, several years ago, I decided I really needed to start to engage with more people. And I started a book group. Um, and it was such a rewarding experience. Uh, and now some of my closest friends actually come from that. So, you know, taking one specific action like that can really make such a great difference in your life for years to come. So. Um, there's a, a book that probably all of you have heard of called The Artist's Way, and she has this pie that she makes you do, makes you do, I mean, you should want to do it, but um, it's it comes to very, your house. very similar domains um, that you talked about, Ben. Um, I think they're about, um, well, I guess there's six of them, and it's divided into six parts, and you track how you feel about each domain. and it's kind of a holistic view because you can't only be an actor or only be a writer and focus your whole entire life on that. You'd be miserable. And so if you are miserable, you might find that your health or your um, 
I think she has one section for spirituality or for family, is like really lacking. And then you look at it and you're like, oh, okay, okay. now like, you know, I've got a great agent, but I'm totally miserable, why? And then you can fill it out. And, and that's a really important thing. And that's what we were talking about from the very beginning is like, you, you know, talking about relationships and, and, and your whole life and not just being an actor. You can be, you know, so many other things and, and, and make that important to you, but yeah, just keep it all whole. Creative and spirituality, those are the other domains. I, um, <laughs> I think what's, what is important about a lot of this is, again, having the holistic picture of what you actually want and are committed to having. And I'm gonna steal this from Ryan, who always reminds me that oftentimes, uh, opportunities are dressed up as distractions. And it's the other way around. Distractions. Distractions are dressed up as distractions. Yes, that. See, I know, that's why you should have said it he first. He was distracted. Um, so uh, yes, distractions are dressed up as opportunities, right? So when you get clear on what it is that you actually want, you can know like, wow, this thing seems like it would be a really cool opportunity, but actually, that's actually not what I'm working on in my life right now, you know? I, maybe producing a film is actually gonna be a distraction from what I actually said that I'm up to this year or whatever the case may be. And I find that that's been a huge thing in my life where I find myself spending a ton of time on something that seems like it would be cool. And people are like, oh, that's so awesome, you're doing that. And then I stop and I go, wait a second, I, don't, I didn't actually want to be finding money for a movie that I'm not in. Why am I doing this? <laughs> so, so I can stop doing that and, and come back to, okay, what are the things I actually want in my life? And then the, the other thing I wanna say is with all the domains, I think it can feel a little overwhelming sometimes. I personally like to, again, every year come back to all of those things, but then I find that I, make, I may make a couple priorities you know, every quarter. You know, I have um, a, a masterminds group that, that I'm in that we keep each other accountable, and every quarter I come back and revisit, okay, for the next few months, what are the main things I want to be focusing on? Or we did the same thing in my business. You know, in the next three months, what is the number one thing that as a company we're committed to making sure we have happen? So I'll focus on different domains more than others in any given period of time, but making sure that I'm aware of all of them. Well, I think people get um, caught up in, I know I have a habit of getting caught up in all of the 15 things I want to accomplish. Mm -hmm. The minutia. And the, yeah, and then, getting, and then I get specific, oh, I want this to look like this, 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 and then nothing happens for months because I'm so overwhelmed by all of the things that I said I wanted to do. Uh, so, so focusing on one or two things at a time really supports me. And, um, and going back to the thing you said about distractions being dressed up as opportunities, the beautiful thing about life is that when you learn a lesson, you f immediately find another opportunity to relearn it on a higher level. <laughs> so the, the better you get at identifying a distraction that's masquerading as an opportunity, the more tricky they get and the more close they look. I would have to agree. I want to respond to your what you said about having one or two things to prioritize. Maybe six years ago, I was forced to only prioritize for maybe two or three months on three things. And I'm the kind of person who has like 20 things on their list. I'm an actor, I'm a writer, I'm a director, I want to do this, I want to do that. I was teaching yoga, I was doing this. And it's like, uh, it, it was too much even for the person, I was taking a workshop and she was teaching it and she was like just completely overwhelmed just listening to me talk about all these things and I was so <laughs> resistant to choosing three things. I mean, I, I thought I couldn't do it. Uh, but what happened at the end of those couple of months is that I really tried because I was committed and things happened. And just because I left those other things alone, they didn't disappear. They were still there. And if they were important enough, they would come back into my life. But it's a great way of prioritizing because, um, yeah, that's a huge thing for me is prioritizing. I have to say, you sound like the majority of the clients that I work with. I mean, you know, interesting, smart, creative people have a lot going on. It's controlled you know? chaos. <laughs> Well, sometimes it's control. <laughs> That's how I like to think of it. <laughs> but it, it does make it, uh, it makes life interesting, and um, and and it is true when you when you set your mind to really focus. I know for myself and for my clients, yeah, when we really focus on something and keep coming back to it, you know, can really make some progress. 
And, and, and the idea of choosing, too, really helps. Just, you know, a few months ago um, when I was, like, quasi-pregnant. I mean, I was already showing, and I knew there was this deadline. And, you um, yeah, you could be more or less pregnant. But, like, I wasn't able to, I wasn't able to wow. hide it anymore at auditions, and I was like, okay, I'm running out of time. Like, and I need to finish. I have this script, and I have three months to finish it. I need to finish it by January 31st. And I'm part of this accountability group, a small one. And they all looked at me, and they were like, are you crazy? But you just listed six other things that you needed to do. How important is it to really finish that script? And... I was like, it's really important. I'm going to put that on the top of my priority list. And I didn't touch it for three months. <laughs> and that's a lesson, too, is like if you prioritize something over and over again, but you don't do anything, like think about it. Either it's the way you're wording it and the way you are talking about the goal and what you want from it, or it's just really not as urgent or important as you thought it was. And that's a really good lesson. <laughs> And I'm not kicking myself of, over not writing one single word of that script. I want to, um, we're going to get into phrases, but I want to, everyone's kind of mentioned it, so I want to hit on it now. The idea of accountability groups, career action groups, there's a gazillion names for them. Um, how have those helped you in this context of goal setting? What has it done for you? What, how has it assisted you? Oh, it's immensely powerful. I, most of the time when I teach, I do it in small groups. Um, because, and I empower them to support each other. I, I'm there holding the space and facilitating less so than teaching because the greatest thing you can do in the world is have a, a brain trust behind you. And, um, and Ben and I are in the same uh, accountability group and, and we, 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 I think we find that sometimes we just sit there and like we're in awe of the people that are in this group with us who, who maybe when we met them we didn't know that they were so great at X but that happened to be the one skill set that I lacked that I really needed. And they just, here they are in my life, and they happen to know all about this thing, and I didn't even know that they did. I'm part of a two account accountability, I have an accountability partnership, which is just me and one other person, which works a little differently than the, a group. Um, and then I have a group that I'm part of, which is just five people. And we're like a running train. I think we've been together for four years straight. Um, and it is amazing how you look at other people and you're like, wow, how did they just do that? Or how, you know, and, and to ha have, that's a great word, brain trust, um, to have that support network that's always there. Uh, and one thing we do every single morning is by nine o'clock, I think we're getting lazy, it's like 9, 30, 10 now, but by nine o'clock, every single person has list, uh, emailed everybody else and told them, what they're going to do for the rest of the day. And we try to keep it under five items. Um, and it just keeps you accountable on a daily basis. And if you don't get it all done, that's OK. Because sometimes life, you know, sometimes you get three auditions and everything that you wanted to do goes out the window. And you're just running around town, right? Um, but it, that it, accountability is everything and uh, we can't just be this one person doing everything by ourselves and like taking over the universe we need help and it's good to ask for help it's good to give help and it's just it's a necessary part of humanity and society i guess if we want to really get woo woo but uh yeah and then the par the partnership that i do with just um, one other person is uh, specifically for writing, and it's very, very specific and career-oriented because we do the same exact thing, and we're on the same path. And that's that's more personal, but that also is very helpful. But it's not on a daily basis. Yeah. Well, I um, I facilitate groups, and I <clears throat> excuse me, I have a, a a group going on right now, and. It's really wonderful to hear how everybody makes progress, and it's sort of invisible, but you get to the end of a, a series, and it's like, wow, look look where we've come. Um, so it, it is really wonderful to have that support. And, you know, I think the thing about um, having that kind of support, you know, I think that so many of us I think that we should be able to do everything ourselves. Mm -hmm. I know I, I still do and I know that I can't and it's just so much uh, it's, it's such a better process when you've got somebody to do it with you and to, to know that you can kind of lean back on other people and, and they'll be there um, to support you so it, it, it's really um, I think having somebody to bounce off of and especially 
um, being an extrovert, if for me, if I have one other person who I can just talk things out with, so much more is available than I, I can do when I'm sitting there by myself typing things out. So I, I think having um, the mirror of other people to work with is really valuable. Everything they said. <laughs> I have three accountability groups. Um, I'm a member of Actor Salon. I have weekly things that, that I'm doing. I think I just made my vision board, and one of the quotes I found was something to the effect of, you can do everything yourself, but you don't have to. Okay. And especially as a creative, it's so easy to, to become siloed, and I'm going to do everything myself. And, and I constantly remind myself that there's no extra credit for the struggle. Like, if I book a series regular because all my friends help me, like, I'm still on that show. Like, great. Then if I did it myself and no one helped me, which is kind of impossible anyway, right? But, like, why would I make that extra struggle? And the other thing that we, we touched on that I think is really important is to have people in these, your accountability groups, whatever they are, who have strengths that you don't, right? Because then they're seeing things that maybe you wouldn't otherwise. I have, when, when we started our um, tuition specialist was the name of the education company that I had, uh, we took Strengths Finder, which is a personality test you can do that, that looks at your various different strengths. And my business partners and I looked at the strengths we had and a lot of them were very complimentary. We were very much like, anything will happen. It's all going to work out. Everything's great. And we didn't have anybody who was like, so how are you going to pay for that? <laughs> or you know that people have to pay us, right? And that some people maybe won't. And we'll have things to do. So someone with that critical thinking uh, skill set. So that was the next person we hired. And he, he, to this day, it's the three of us are the main business partners because we were looking for someone with complimentary skill sets. So adding that into your life as well so that people can, that's why I have coaches like Brian and other coaches who coach me on things that I wouldn't necessarily see. Well, I think it's important too, if you create an accountability group, I think there's a lot of value in having a coach who is, who runs your group or is a facilitator of your group, which it sounds like you do, because the, what the accountability group that Ben and I are in, all of us are to a point of success now, which is awesome but we're getting to a place where it's becoming more of a challenge for us to hold each other accountable because we're all so busy doing the awesome things that we've created together. And so now we're talking about maybe we should hire a coach to facilitate our accountability group for us. But if you are going to create one, make sure that you aren't doing anybody a favor who's not ready and that you're not selling out on people by not being honest. Um, and uh, I do have a very group of, of skill sets and personality types, but watch out for poison playmates, people who are always negative, uh, people who, who aren't going to hold up their end of the bargain and hold you accountable either. So be strategic. It's, this is, um, you only get to live life once. And I think what you said about not getting credit for the struggle is key. You know, if you take 10 years to get somewhere where someone else took two, no one's going to say, oh, good for you. You did that in 10 years? Oh, that must have been a struggle. Martin Luther King does, isn't the only African-American man with a statue in Washington, D.C. because he was killed. It wasn't the struggle. It wasn't the awful things that happened to him. It was what he created, what he accomplished. So you can do it alone. Or. Can, can I just say one more thing about accountability groups? The one other thing that you have to watch out for is outgrowing them. Um, I've outgrown a couple of uh, accountability groups and you have to recognize that and be okay with leaving and saying I no longer get as much as I put in um, and that's kind of like what you were talking about but in the reverse um, so there will be a point you may some of you be part of groups already that you may be like wait why am I here and so don't automatically just put that under the rug like that that's something that's important to think about too yeah. great um getting back to the ideas of goals and action items what um can you give us some examples of the best way to word or phrase a goal or action item because we talked about phrasing a little while ago so i want to get back to that i will uh and i'll go down um i i think language is incredibly important and how you phrase a goal matters a lot Starting with, as Ryan said, coming from the positive, right? As opposed to like, well, um, I want to look less bad or whatever, focusing like on the negative. <laughs> Phrase it in the positive. I want, I want this. I'm telling you, people, you'll see it. Um, and it's sometimes like I'll do it. I'll be like, oh my God, how did I get away with phrasing it this way? But so getting super, super specific. So for example, um, 
health and like weight loss is an easy, easy way to give an example. If, if your goal is like, I want to lose weight. So like if you lose like a quarter of a pound, like technically you accomplished your goal. So vague. And, right, and so, and the vagueness of that will, will translate. And I noticed that as I was doing these annual reviews, every time I would have a vague goal, I would accomplish it. I'd be like, I want to book a film. And I would book like the worst film ever that's like <laughs> horrible and I had a terrible experience. I was like, I, I get to be more specific next year about the kind of film I'm going to book. So be aware of the level of specificity is, is the level to which you'll actually attain that goal. So getting specific and, um, and setting, I call them like process goals. So setting goals around like the process of getting something. So rather than like just having the goal of, I want to lose 10 pounds, having a goal of getting into the gym and then getting even smaller into like what will actually get you there. So rather than saying, well, I, I definitely, my goal is to, to do uh, a two hour workout three days a week. That's a lot. And, and especially if you're sort of starting from nowhere, it's like overwhelming. But if, if instead the goal is, my goal is that every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, when I wake up, I put on my gym clothes and I step foot in the gym. Because if I'm wearing my gym clothes and I step foot in the gym, I'm probably going to work out. Like I'm probably going to like lift some weights. What, what about if you're just wearing your gym clothes and you never leave the house? I honestly, I think that's better. <laughs> I like, really, I think if you start with that and you put on your gym clothes and you step foot in the gym and then go and then you just leave, like that's better because you're building up the habit of creating that as a thing in your life. And I would much rather that you start building that habit by literally walking into the gym and then leaving than sitting at home being like, ugh, I didn't, I didn't do anything today. And doesn't it take like 21 days to start a habit? Does anybody know that number? It's, it's the it's magic number. 21 to start and then 90 days... I forgot what the 90 days is, but, the, but it's two years to make it stick. Oh, two, years. two years. And so I would say, you know, with a lot of this, allow it to be, <laughs> I'm, I'm a big fan of, of habits and, and sort of how you're creating ongoing things in your life. So setting the small goals of like, like if, if, I, if at the beginning of the year, I'm like, I really want to read more books. Like that's just a goal. I want to be more well-read rather than necessarily setting some specific goal there. I'll say, I'm going to read 15 minutes a day. That's my goal because I can always find 15 minutes, right? Like if there's something that's important to me, I can always find 15 minutes. So rather than saying, I'm going to read a book a week and then all of a sudden it's May and I haven't read a book and I'm like, ah, I'm never going to read again. Like clearly I don't care. It's like, no, like 15 minutes a day, that's attainable. I can come back, oh, you know, I can find 15 minutes to make that happen. Well, I think, well, specificity is important on every level. So the, the, the goal post, the end line, my, my main thing, my big vision for whatever it is in my life that I want, and then specificity working backwards from that. Do um, you guys know who Margaret Cho is? So if you don't know, she's a comedian who, whose main audience is the LGBT community. And she says that um, when she was a little girl, she said she wanted to be surrounded by beautiful men. Um, and now she says she should have been more specific. <laughs> So um, all that to say, <laughs> be specific about what the end goal is. But when you're working backward from that, when you're creating your plan to get there, be specific about what that looks like too. However, don't be attached to what it looks like. Create a plan that's strong enough to withstand the challenge of reinvention. Because if I'm driving at night in the fog, I know, that, I know what house I'm headed to if I'm driving to go see my aunt in Alabama or something. I don't have an aunt in Alabama, but let's just say I do. But it's not, at night, foggy in the middle of nowhere. Uh, my GPS might tell me halfway the way there that there's an accident and I need to take a different state route. You know, I may, I may, all sorts of things could happen along the way. So I know where I'm headed and I'm so clearly specific on exactly where I'm headed that even if I can only see is right in front of me, the very next step where my low beams will show me, I know where I'm headed. So if my path deviates, if my plan changes, I'm so specific that I can shift and I don't lose track. Um, I don't see it. Do you like that? Good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about this. Um, going back to a little bit of the career, we'll, we'll hit on this because um, obviously this is a room full of actors. It's been said that there's over 40, sorry, 40 entertainment careers one can pursue in this business. Over 40. Realistically, how many can an actor pursue at any given time? So the examples would be like soap operas would be one. Um, one hour drama would be another. Half an hour comedy would career. Hosting would be another. Realistically, how many do you think an actor can pursue at any given time? Based on all the stuff we've been talking about. I say pick one. I I say, I, I can't pick one of anything. I, but I say, you can't, 
you can't do more than two at a time. I, I mean, I wouldn't go more than that. I don't know. I, that's a really 40? There's 40. Yeah. That but, blows but, but my I mind. Think that, but you think commercials and then right. games, like well, all. Well, okay. Well, I'm an example. I am. Um, commercials have been my bread and butter for the last 10 years, but I'm also a theatrical actor. So that's two. Um, but I once tried to concentrate on comedic stuff, like sitcom y stuff, and also one hour dramas. And that was a total mistake because then you're going to all these workshops, you don't know what you're do like when I, I actually don't go to workshops anymore, but when I did, I was just all over the place and I had no, everything was vague, there was no specificity, and we keep talking about specificity, but it's so important. And if you don't know what you want, that's the first problem. I mean, that don't, don't even go any further. Just spend a month figuring out, or two or three, or however long it takes. It could take you a year to figure out what you really want. Like, why are you here? Why do you live in LA and not in, you know, Palm Springs or, or Kansas City? Like, there's a reason, but maybe you don't know it yet. Well, I think there's a lot of value to being a specialist. But I think what you're saying is really important. You have to be clear on what you really do want. Not what you'll settle for, not what is most likely, not what I know other people have done or can do. Or, or what other people say you would be great at. Oh, like, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, you'd be so great on Monk. It's like, well. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> Um, I, have a, I, I have a client who is Australian, and she, she's a good friend of mine t as well. And she is tailor-made for the kinds of roles that um, Carrie Mulligan plays. I mean, that's just, that is, and that's what she wants. She's always wanted that. That's what she's committed to creating. And she was about to, she was looking at the possibility of, oh, I should do commercial workshops and I should get a print agent and all this stuff. And, um, and she had just, she just booked a, sm a small role in Fruitvale Station. And, uh, and I said, stop. All of those things will create brand confusion for you. Better that you have one credit on your resume that is perfect for what you do than you have all these other things on your resume that show you have worked, but don't show the people that you want to hire you what you're here to do. And as a producer, as someone who hires actors, if I'm looking for someone who can be in a gritty drama that maybe includes nudity and grotesque stuff because it's a real raw thing about war or something, I might be less inclined to hire the actor who auditioned really well, but all his other work was on a soap opera. Exactly. You know. yeah, I have the same experience with my casting process. It's like, you know, he's really funny, but why does he have all this other drama stuff? I mean, it, it almost doesn't make sense. And it doesn't mean you can't branch out, but yeah, you got to be careful about brand. Well, and I'll, I'll just throw in that, you know, I, I work with people who are, as I said, either trying to get in or trying to get out um, of the industry. <clears throat> and I have worked with people who are not getting as much acting work that they'd like to get, and they need to make money in another way. So there's oftentimes lots of uh, lots of ways that they're putting their life together, and and we would call that a portfolio career, right? Where you're using a lot of your different um, skills and talents. And one of the most horrible thing for anybody who's intelligent and creative is to be bored and not using your your capacities, you know, your mind. And um, so I've had clients who have started writing and, um, and been very successful with that so that it's um, a close cousin to the acting um, and keeps them in the same world. So I suppose that's potentially two of those careers, two of those 40, um, but they're different, but similar. I think the, the specific number depends a little bit on how your <laughs> life is set up. And that's where a lot of this strategic planning and stuff comes in is like looking at how much time are you actually spending on things in your life. I'm a huge fan of tracking everything, measuring everything so that you can see. And normally, I think people get afraid of like, what if I don't accomplish my goals? Like, I don't want to set it because what if I don't get there? What I find is that if you set a goal to make a million dollars and then you make 900,000, like, that's still pretty good. <laughs> and I think you'd be happy. So, like, go for that. Is there a gap? Sure. Did you not make a million dollars? Sure. But that's okay. That's not necessarily, it doesn't have to be bad. Like, it's okay if there's something missing. Well, bad is a judgment that we created. Like, you know, bad and good is a human invention. You know, it, before before mankind came along with the ability to have opinions, you know, lions ate 
sheep or whatever, and that wasn't bad or good, it was just what happened. So if, so if you're hesitant to set a specific goal, you get to look at what has you being hesitant. But the great thing about setting a specific goal and not making it personal, if you almost get there or whatever that is, is maybe you make $900,000. First of all, you've probably made more money than you would have if you hadn't been bold enough to be specific. But more importantly, now you have set yourself up to be able to review the process and see what didn't work. So you can look at, A, what didn't work about how I set that goal or how I, how I executed that goal, and B, where else does that show up in my life? Because chances are, if you're doing something here that, keep, that gets you 90%, you're probably doing that everywhere else. The way you do anything is the way you do everything. So setting goals supports you in improving every aspect of your life. I wanted to add one more thing that Una said, which is, you know, you can't do more than two at a time. And I think that that's a big key that especially as creatives, we get stuck in this, like, I want to do everything. Mm -hmm. And partly we do, and that's okay. Like, I would love to be, like, do like a Toy Story movie, but Tom Hanks didn't start out doing voiceover. Mm -hmm. He became Tom Hanks, and then they asked him to do voiceover. So, again, coming back to what is it that you really want, and if you say, like, well, I just, I, like, I hear a lot, like, I just, I just want to be a working actor. That might be true. When I ask other questions, I generally find, though, that a lot of times it's not. I'm like, if you were working industrial commercials and making $60,000 a year, would you be happy? Well, no, no, I want to be, okay, cool, that's fine, that's great. So, so what is it then that you actually want such that you're, that you're creating that? And then, and then focusing on it, and that's where the opportunity distraction thing comes along, which says if I'm, if why I'm in Los Angeles or, or New York or wherever, is to be on a half hour sitcom and that's it, like that's really, really what I want, then I get to focus all my time on that and if some great thing comes along, oh, there's this cool commercial class I can take for free, awesome, that's somebody else's opportunity. That's my distraction because I'm working on booking a sitcom. And for me, like my personal experience, I needed to try a lot of things to figure out what I wanted. So I spent my first couple years in LA doing a little bit of voiceover and doing a little bit of this and taking this class and doing that so I could narrow down and say, oh, actually, these couple things are what I really most love to do. And that's okay, too. And, and allowing yourself to approach it with that mindset of like, I'm exploring to figure out what it is that I want. That's awesome. And um, so that's where the revisiting comes in, is constantly revisiting. And this could be done on a monthly basis. I don't know if I would recommend weekly, but because that just would drive me nuts personally. But, um, you know, there are life changes. I mean, my obviously my pregnancy is a really big example, but um, I thought, okay, so now I have to change things because I can't just be the girlfriend in the football commercial or whatever because I'm, I just can't. Physically, it's not possible. Um, but what can I do to keep my career going um, if that's what you want to do, in my case, it was. Um, but that's, that required constant revisiting like every single month. Now I'm showing, now I'm not. Am I, can I still hide it, blah, blah, blah. It's like it, it, you have to just, and, and the more you revisit, the more specific you get. Well, it, it's important to remember that life is supposed to be an exciting, enriching, fulfilling journey first, mm -hmm. and everything else is second to that. So if, if you don't know what kind of actor you want to be, awesome. Be excited about finding out. Don't feel bad about not knowing yet. That's a, first of all, that's a huge waste of time because feeling bad isn't going to help you know faster. Um, but, but also, you're missing the point. You're missing the point. The whole point of being alive is to be enriched and fulfilled and to get something out of the experience, not just a goal. So goals are a way to create what you want, but not meant to be a replacement for living your life fully. And I, I, I want to say um, one more thing about um, goals. Actually, you know what? I don't. I slipped my mind. It's, it's all good. Gone. Ben's got your back. You wanted to say uh, something. If you so. catch it. Let me I, have, okay. I think that's really important. And I clearly, I'm a huge fan of like goal setting and strategic planning, like I'm on here talking about it. If you're only living your life to accomplish the next goal, like Ryan said, you're missing the point. And I see <clears throat> with acting, I, I think it's particularly difficult in terms of like what goals to set because the, the ones that come up most often that I see are getting representation, whether it's a manager, theatrical agent, or commercial agent, and booking some level of role, co-star, guest star, series regular, whatever, like those are the goals that I always see actors setting. And there's nothing wrong with that. 
I think that's great. I, I might put that more in sort of the vision category as I talked about it. But I think those are not the only markers of a career. And oftentimes, those markers come a couple years in. The majority of time, they do. And so I see a lot of, especially beginning actors, get really stuck being like, oh my god, I haven't booked a pilot. I, haven't, I don't have an agent. And they're doing great. But that one goal is not perhaps the goal to be focused on. So that's why, again, I like revisiting, checking in on progress. And one of the main things that I do, especially in a creative career, is I set goals around relationships. How many relationships, new relationships am I developing with people in the industry? And what is the quality of my relationship with these people? Am I, when I can look back at my, my contact database and see, wow, I met 20 amazing directors this year. Holy cow, that's incredible. And I personally would rather meet and be friends with Aaron Sorkin than like book a guest star. Mm -hmm. I want both those things, but if in a year, if my goal is to book a guest star and I didn't, but I met and I was buddies with Aaron Sorkin, like I won, like I, I won, I won. So allowing myself to be like celebrating those pieces of progress, and that's one of the reasons I think goal setting is so great, because you can celebrate along the way and be like, man, I am making progress, especially when oftentimes your family or friends or partners don't understand the progress of a creative career, goal setting and checking in and being like, wow, like I'm making progress, I think is really motivating. Well, and I, the thing I wanna, I just wanna throw this in real quick, I remembered the thing, which is your feelings are not the same as you. So one of the things I see creative people do a lot is set a goal, but peter out in their excitement about it before they accomplish the goal, and they go on and do something else. And then what happens if you do that over and over again is you make no progress. So, um, so a friend of mine says feelings come and go like farts. Um, uh, so, so be so committed to whatever is it, whatever it is that you're creating that the way you feel about it is unimportant. It's irrelevant. I don't feel like working on it today. Not important. I'm still committed. I'm not as um, I'm not a over the moon excited about it, but I still want it. Doesn't matter. I'm committed. But I think what you're talking about there is your values, right? So the things that. Um, are really important to us on a uh, really endearing, uh, enduring um, basis. That's what really makes our lives fulfilling, right? When we're, when we're working and doing something that really resonates to us on a, on a, a real gut level. So if, you know, having, um, having really close relationships with the people you work with you know, if that's what's really important, then maybe you're going to work with a, a smaller um, uh, uh, group of actors, and you're you're going to always look for an ensemble that you want to work with. You know, you start to be able to call down what's what's going to continue to um, to work for you. So I think the values piece is really fundamental to all of this goal setting. You know, where you really come down to, you know, we, we've touched on this. What do you really want? You know, how do you really want to feel in your life? You know, I've worked with clients who just cannot take going out on auditions. It's just, after a while, it just saps the life out of them. And so that becomes a real value of, like, no, I, I want to have one place where I'm working. I don't want to be driving around all the time. You know that becomes a, 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 a fundamental value that then becomes how do we create the next goal? So really looking at what's driving you. Can I ask a question on that? I'm curious. I think that's great around values. I'm curious if you guys have ways that you or or ways that you coach others to get in touch with, identify what those core values are. Well, I, I have a, um, a, a worksheet that I work with clients, but I listen a lot. I mean, you know, when, when somebody, um, flexibility comes up a lot with uh, clients that say, you know, a new mother um, doesn't want to keep going to an office, for example. Um, <clears throat> or, um, oh gosh, I mean, there's countless things that, that we work on, but we just keep listening for what's driving this person. And sometimes the things that drive you crazy give you a really good hint <laughs> right, on what you want and what you don't want. Um, you guys were both touching on it a little bit, but with very different terminology. But I, I was using the word revisit, and I was thinking specifically about revisiting my goal 
and not reviewing it, but just seeing like if I still wanted it. But then you were talking about revisiting, and it was more talking about uh, like the act of reviewing, and both of those go hand in hand. That's really important. Like so, and then you're talking about you know figuring out what's working for you. The way to do that is to go back and see like what did I want last year, and did I get it, and how did I get it. Um, without looking back, you, you there's, you're kind of missing a large piece of that. Well, I think um, your results will always show you what you're committed to. So whatever the results are, whether you like them or not, um, that's a really good clue as to what your values truly are. And I, I think also we have a habit of wanting to know because when we know something about ourselves or about others or about the world that gives us this false sense of security, so I always invite people to not know, to be in discovery, and to be committed to the discovery and finding out, and always being in that space instead of knowing. Well, now I know this about myself. I mean, once you know something, know something, you, the, the opportunity for possibility goes away. So always be in the discovery. Always, always be excited about finding new I don't new know if I agree with that. <laughs> I agree with I, that. I don't know. I mean, I'm glad I, we have something to disagree on. This yeah. is great. No, well, I mean, I, I like knowing certain things. It doesn't mean that they won't change. I mean, we all know that everything changes. I mean, we're biological entities, so everything's always changing. But I do also really like knowing that there are certain things I can tolerate and certain things that I don't want to tolerate. And I think it's really very important to be able to take a stand on something Absolutely. and say there's a yes and a no. So, Absolutely. Um, and those are things that come from knowing. And so I disagree. <laughs> I, mean, I think you guys are actually talking about two different things. I think so. Yeah. yeah. I think so because I'm not saying, I'm not saying don't have values. I'm saying, um, <laughs> what I, but, but I am saying, I always end every sentence that's declarative with, unless it isn't. Not because it, it isn't necessarily. Like, what, for instance, I won't have sex for money. That's definitely a value of mine. But for the sake of the exercise, it is a guiding principle. But for the sake of exercise, anytime I make a statement, even like that, which I know I know, unless I am. Not because, not because tomorrow I might change my mind and go be willing to work a corner. Um, but circumstances but, might... Well, not even that. Not even that. I'm just in the practice of oh, looking at what I'm, what I'm finding, what I don't know, I don't know. Yeah. So, no, I'm not... Uh, yes, absolutely. Having values, <laughs> for sure. Be sure. Be clear. I want somebody to diagram that whole thing for me. That was really interesting. Well, um, um, go ahead. Una, and then we'll jump into some questions. So, I mean... I get, maybe I want to wrap up you two. I feel like I need to, to be in the, I'm literally in the middle. Piece. No, but um, the, I come from a yogic background and we always talk about being present. Um, and that's like a Buddhist thing. It's this, I mean, you know, it's, a, it's kind of a universal thing at this point, especially in LA. Yeah, especially in LA. Um, I had an uncle who said, oh, you're so LA, or whatever. Um, Thank you. We and I started talking about yoga. Uh, but. It is what it is. That's how I see that. And so it's, it's that kind of, like, what, did, what was your terminology, your phrase? Uh, unless what it isn't. It, unless it isn't. So by my phrase, it's kind of the sim similar thing is, it is what it is. So if you had a really horrible audition and you just never are going to go in to see that casting director again, like, it is what it is. Move on. There's hundreds of casting directors in this town. You don't have to get stuck on one thing. So I guess maybe that's... Great. Thank you. We're going to get some audience questions. The first question is from Emma. Do we have Emma in the house? Where's Emma? Thanks, Emma. Um, she actually asked a question that I want to ask, so you read my mind, Emma. Um, how are you guys um, documenting these goals? What, are you using programs? How do you, is it Excel sheets? Is it hand notes? How are you guys just keeping track of things and keeping it accessible and writing things down? Her specific question is, what systems do you like to use to organize all this? I use Ben's template. I use my template. Uh, I don't know what Ben's template I'll, I'll set, is. I'll put, it on, I'll, put it, I'll put a link on my website. You guys can download it. Yeah. Um, it's not on there right now, but I'll put it on uh, in the next day. Um, so I use that. I, I, I was on a sag, uh, benwhitehair.com. Um, you go, I'm easy to stalk if you just Google my name. Um, bring me food. Do my laundry. Uh, no. Um, I, uh, <laughs> um, 
I also, I did, a, we, there was a panel on productivity and stuff. If you guys, for SAG Foundation, if you want to look back in the archives, I talked a lot about a lot of the systems that I use, if you want to get really nitty gritty on that. A, I think find what works for you and test it. You know, try using Evernote. Try the getting things done philosophy. Try a planner by hand. You know, there's not a right way to do it. And just track it and see what the, your results are. You know, like, wow, I did this. I didn't think I'd like it. But man, I got everything I wanted to get done done. Cool. You're fine. You know, something's working for you. I like to recommend that people only, you know, adjust one thing at a time. Right? It's like all of a sudden, you know, January 1st, like, I'm going to get in shape. I'm going to go to the gym. I'm going to change how I eat. I'm going to change like a million things. And then it all peters out. So, you know, allow yourself to have the long view. Let it be a marathon, not a sprint with your systems. And try stuff out and just see what works for you. I personally like getting things done, the philosophy that David Allen came up with, um, and the computer program OmniFocus. And then, like I said, I mean, the main thing I use is the annual review that I do. Uh, every year looking back at the last year and then setting up the, the coming year and then coming back to that. I like to do a review on my birthday, which is in June, and then I like to do it at the end of the year. And um, But I, I just like to write things down. I have a journal. I like to write things down. And then also, because I have a template that um, I work with with my clients, and we just break down, as I said, you know, three specific actions to do in each area of, of life. And um, keep that right in front of you, you know, wherever it is. I do say write it down. Yeah. Studies should research shows over and over, over again. When you write it down, you're more likely to do it. Um, I was a big fan of paper. And I used to have a Moleskine notebook. And I would write everything down. And it was like a big one that was uh, for like each calendar day. And then like five years ago, I discovered getting things done. And that was amazing, and I tried things, uh, which is, uh, these are all computer programs now. There's things, there's to do, and there's OmniFocus. And they're both, they're all three of them very similar, but then OmniFocus kind of rose to the top. And then I was using OmniFocus forever. And then I realized something wasn't working, because things change, right? We all talk about change and, and being able to adapt. Now I just use paper again, but I don't just like have little pieces of paper flying around and, and post-its, you know, that just doesn't work. You have to keep everything contained. So I discovered something that my new accountability partner does, which is amazing, a binder. And then you can have all your domains and you feel like you're in school again. It's kind of great um, because there was a certain structure that we all kind of got used to after 12 years or 13 or whatever. And um, yeah. Now I just write everything down and it feels really good to actually cross something out however you do it. Check X's, cross the thing out, um, highlighting with your real physical hand, not just like tick, 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 tick with your mouse. It just, for me, that's how it morphed. I, I, I agree with writing things down. It's not real for me unless I wrote it with my hand. Um, it isn't. And I also write down things that I forgot to write down, but then I accomplish them and then check them off. Oh, uh, yeah. I do that, that too. I do that because the, you need that record. You have to have it on record. You yes. have to see it. Yes. But everybody thinks differently. So don't think that because it worked for someone else that it, it's meant to work for you. Um, I want to um, piggyback on that question. Um, let's talk a little bit about calendar versus a to-do list. When do you use a calendar? When do you use a to-do list? Because sometimes you can put it on the calendar, but maybe it should be on the to-do list instead. The, um, the, um, who's the guy who wrote Getting Things Done David again? Allen. David Allen, I think, is like the best at describing what is the difference between calendar items and, and action items. But the calendar is like something that can't change. Like you have to get that done. You have to go to the doctor appointment at 1.30. You have to file that paperwork by February 15th, uh, things like that. Everything else. If it needs to change, it can. And so I think that's the, the biggest difference if I, I don't know, I haven't read that in a while, but he has yeah. an audio book too, which is great, because you can just listen to it over and over in your car. His TED Talk is amazing as well. He, gave a, he gives a really good TED Talk on the value of having a system. Like everything we're talking about, I think a lot of it for me, what changed was getting all of the things out of my head and into some too. sort of system, and it, it dramatically changed my creativity. My creativity in as an actor in business, like my I like all of a sudden I was like, oh my god, I can breathe. Like, yeah, you because my mind wasn't going a million miles a minute because I knew that what I needed to get done would get taken care of because I had the systems in place mm -hmm. that worked for me. And again, it's I'm constantly revisiting and tweaking and trying different things. Um, but I think 
for me, the key was that having something where I could get the stuff out of my head, um, the, the calendar distinction for me is, yeah, it's just anything that's like an actual appointment I put on the calendar. Otherwise, it goes into my to-do system. Same with an email. An e email is not a particularly effective to-do system. But uh, folders and email is really it can, important. Yeah, totally. You have to do that. Um, yes, that's definitely. That's really important. I don't know if that has anything to do with goal setting. But no, that's yeah. organization is... Oh, huge thing. Cool I, 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 you know, I exclusively use my calendar. I mean, I use the to-do list thing on my iPhone a little bit, but I use my calendar because I also like to schedule when I'm doing things that I don't need an appointment for. And for me, psychologically, I need to see it all in one place for it to click in my brain. So I do use my calendar, but you know, I use a little bit block of time for something that'll take ten minutes and a bigger block of time. That so, but that I way I can move that. it around and yeah, it works for me. But you know, it might not work for me next week, so we'll see. <laughs> I would say that's uh, the the point of using calendar. You know. If you're treating your calendar that way, you know, scheduling in the time for those things that you might otherwise avoid, or you know what, every Wednesday at 10 a.m., I'm gonna have you know an hour where I work on my actor marketing, or you know, putting those things in the calendar such that it becomes a habit of of who's the who's the writer who had the quote uh, something to the effect of I they, I think it was like Stephen King or someone who's very prolific, and and someone asked how do you write so much, like you've written dozens and dozens of novels, you're writing all the time, how? And he says, well, you know, I only, I only write when I'm inspired to write. Thankfully, I'm inspired to write every single morning at 9 a.m. on the dot. <laughs> Having those systems in place and putting it in your calendar so you have an appointment with yourself that's like, you know what, no, I'm, I'm going to get up every day mm -hmm. and I'm going to go to the gym or I'm going to write or do those things. And as you build that habit, I think that's where a lot of the results come. I, I just want to make an admission. I'm not good at that. I don't, I can't work like that. And I think, I, I, I tried for so long and I think certain people's brains just won't do that. It's like kind of like, a, you know, everybody has a different way of learning. Um, that like setting the timer for 15 minutes and only do it for 15, that doesn't work for me. Um, so it doesn't work necessarily for, yeah. work it doesn't for me work either. For and it's not that I haven't committed or I haven't. So I want to put that out there that if it doesn't work for you, that's okay because there's a, one out of four of us maybe. Yeah, it, I love when someone <laughs> I love when someone tells you about a system they use and they're so excited about it and you have to try it now and then you try and it's like holy shit this is awful. <laughs> um, but uh, like painful. <laughs> but, uh, one of the things I do though, going back to terminology, is everything is a get to, even the things that are a have to. So I get to renew my car insurance, I get to, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, uh, get, go, to get the a, go to the dentist. Yeah, I, I, I get to all those things. And another terminology thing I thought of looking at you is you can't be half pregnant, which I say all the time. And we <laughs> talked about this earlier before, before coming in, actually. I'm, not, I'm never, you're never a little bit something. That's not a real thing. You either are or are not. So just throwing that in there. Um, this person didn't have their name, so they'll um, be anonymous. Um, let's talk a little bit about distractions. Maybe we can add procrastination to this. How do you... Um, <gasps> How I've do you never done that. Yeah, what's what's that? What's that? How can do, we can get we, to that later? later? They yeah. say <laughs> that they say that procrastination is actually really necessary. Okay. Um, I, it was some. I think Thank it was God. in the New Yorker, uh, uh, like about a year ago, and you could probably Google it. Um, I don't remember. I, I I would love to. Maybe I'll post it in the Sad Foundation yeah. Facebook thing if I find the article because I have it saved somewhere because it was so important to me because I'm a huge procrastinator and I my best friend growing up who I've known since I was seven uh, is was a huge procrastinator and we would procrastinate together and then we would be writing papers in high school at two o'clock in the morning and be on the phone with each other um, and it would be like silence and then half an hour later how many pages do you have oh okay it's that really okay uh -huh. and then there would be like more silence and then my parents realized that the phone bill was just crazy because that was a really <laughs> long time ago but um yeah procrastination teaches you what you're prioritizing that was the basic thing about this uh this article was that the, a little bit of procrastination is okay because it teaches you what what's important you know i are I, you gonna kill it is, is that just terrible i'm no, such no, a no no i you know here's the thing I have a son who is uh, at home procrastinating right now. Um, Maybe he's watching this. Yeah, he's not watching? <laughs> I doubt it. He's procrastinating somehow. But, um, <laughs> but um, you know, th there are different types of people. Um, I, I use the Myers-Briggs type indicator, which is a great personality assessment. and. 
uh, it happens that there are a lot of actors who tend to be a type of uh, personality that procrastinates. And um, I just happen so to nice know that. <laughs> but it's not just actors. I mean, there are a lot of really creative, expressive people who are um, procrastinators, and, and that tends to be the sort of uh, person who likes to work, you know, in a chunk of time, like they'll get really, really into something and really put their focus on it. And I, I've worked with producers and writers and actors who've come into my office, and one of the things that I've found that the way they keep track of their to-do lists is they have lots of them, <laughs> but they oftentimes can't find them. <laughs> <laughs> they should they should put finding them on their to-do list. Right. But um, you know, I I think that it's really hard to work against type. Okay? If if you're a procrastinator, somewhere in there there's a strength. And you know, I also use the strengths finder with my clients as a great assessment. And um, so oftentimes people who are more procrastinator in style um, have adaptability as a strength. So, you, you know, we really have to look at, you know, wh how have we learned to adapt with that um, style? And, you know, so some people really can knock out a great piece of writing in five minutes because they have to. Yes. I mean, I like to break things out, you know, more than do it at the last minute because that freaks me out. But. Well, I'm a proud procrastinator. I really am. And I used to not be. I used to have a lot of guilt and shame about it. And I think, um, I think a lot of people can relate with that. Um, and so the first thing I would say is give up the guilt and shame about it. When you, once you notice you're distracted, oh, awesome, now what? Um, but one of the, there was a CEO, a Fortune 500 CEO, who I, I can't remember who it was at this moment, but I read an interview with him about six months ago, and he said that he always makes a point of hiring procrastinators. Not exclusively, but he always makes sure his teams have procrastinators because procrastinators know how to get something done really well like that because they're 10 minutes before the deadline or whatever that is, and they get it done, and then everyone is impressed at how amazing it is and how well done it was. And, and then, then he hires people who aren't procrastinators, yes, too, to make sure. To balance it out. And so what I've done for myself, uh, it, the, what works for me is I, I learn from people like you who like to parse things out and plan things out, and so I, I have... I'm always in the process of training my mind to do what I want it to do as opposed to whatever it was going to do. So um, I'm always in the practice of training myself to stage myself out. So if I have a big goal, I break down chunks and I make it a point to start working on them whenever I don't feel resistance to it. So that by the time I get to the place where I'm near the finish line, I've already knocked out a lot of stuff when I wasn't wanting to be distracted, because that time comes up just as much as wanting to be distracted, that I, that I can cross the finish line without being in a complete and total panic and needing some kind of medication. My name is Ben and I'm a procrastinator. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't turn in a single paper in any of high school or college sooner, like I didn't start it sooner than the night before. And I graduated with very good grades in all those things. Um, deadlines work for me and that's one of the reasons why accountability groups work for me and why goal setting with a, a specific deadline works for me. Um, because then I, then, then I have a deadline that I can procrastinate to but then get done. Um, <laughs> I find that there's a couple reasons that I procrastinate. Sometimes it's that it's the most important thing I could be doing, and I'm subconsciously probably afraid of it. I'm afraid of failure, I'm afraid of success, some other thing that I'm gonna call my coach and figure out like, oh my God, like this is the thing that is most gonna get me to my goal and I'm resisting it, like what's going on? And that's something deeper that then I'm gonna work on and work through and keep coming back to. Sometimes I'm procrastinating because it's not actually important to me. And it's something that I think I should be doing or like I put on, you know, I, I made, it's like the revisiting the goal. I made the goal and I, and I keep procrastinating and it's why it's, I come back and go, you know what? I've, I've been procrastinating this. If, for me, especially if it's been a year. If it's been over a year that I've procrastinated something, like, oh my God, let it go. Like, <laughs> it's just not something I'm going to do and that's okay, I'll do something else. I was like that with my, um, my actor mailers. I was like, it was this thing that I was like, the, my, my actor marketing and, and I just I wasn't doing it I wasn't doing it and I ultimately ended up hiring somebody to do it for me because I was like I'm just not gonna do it that's not a thing I'm gonna do and sometimes I'll give myself a deadline I'll be like I, th I, I did it just recently over the break I was like I'm going to I think it was something around like writing blog posts I was like I'm going to write 
five of them by this day, and I, I was telling my accountability group, you get to hold me accountable to, I'm going to either have five that I will send to you guys by this date, or I'm releasing it forever. I made my dad do that. I was like, he's like, these things are progressing. I'm like, dad, do it by this day, or release it, and say, you know what, actually, clearly, that, that must not be something that I am committed to, or wanting to, or doesn't fit with my vision, whatever the case may be, and allowing yourself to let it go, such that something new can come in. There's a, um, a little folder that um, David Allen talks about and um, that you can create either physically or on the computer on the, one of those to-do lists called Maybe Someday. And so you don't have, I, I don't like releasing things, so I put things in that folder. And then it kind of, it's like, really, I mean, you're definitely releasing them, but they're still there. And then maybe a couple years later, you're like, oh yeah, whatever happened to that children's book? Like, yeah. you know. Yeah, so Learn Spanish is in there for me. Yeah, yeah. me too. Um, I also, I, like, well, going off what Ben said, I outsource things I don't want to do. Um, yeah, there, there are studies that show That's that... That's so important. Isn't that? Yeah. It's crucial. And there are studies that show that, that the human brain only has the capacity to make so many decisions per day. So like Obama, for instance, only has two suits. And he says it so because he has one less, that's one less decision he has to make each day. Kid, really? Dead serious. Two suits. That's it. Someone so that. I guess that's one is Steve the one Jobs that stays did. on Air Force One. And, <laughs> yeah. That's great. And, it, and, and both of those men have accomplished great things. So, you know, Ben taught me that you can outsource your laundry. I didn't know this. There are companies that will come pick your laundry up, go do it for you, and bring it back to your door whenever you tell them to. Like you can schedule them to come back at a specific time. Uh, so outsourcing whatever it is. And I, I had a lot of resistance to that at first because I thought, well, that it'll cost me a little more money to do, have someone else do it than it will for me to do it myself. But then I'm attaching a dollar amount to my time that's really low. Yeah, the so, service is called your mom. And yeah. you, no, um, <laughs> my so, mom doesn't do my laundry. So, she lives in Colorado. The shipping would be so one exorbitant. Of, one of my big breakthroughs in life is not trading dollars for hours, actually. So my time is priceless. And um, so if I, can, if I can narrow down the things that get to be done in my life to the things that are most important, not the most urgent, but the most important, um, and outsource the rest, then I am maximizing my priceless time. I, the important urgent is something we've kind of, I think, danced around. Stephen Covey talks about it a lot in his book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. It's so easy to spend all of your day dealing with what's urgent, but not what's important. And I think a huge reason why we're all such fans of goal setting and planning is so that you make sure that you do those things that are actually going to move you through social media, our family, our friends, people who want things, all of that. We could spend our whole lives just doing that and get to the end and be like, oh my God, I didn't do anything I wanted to. So coming back to making sure that you're setting aside time and being really, really clear on what's important and not just urgent, right? And I, I use it as a form of procrastination. I'll find myself like, oh yeah, I'm like, I'm being so productive. I sent, you know, 40 emails that didn't matter, right? Like really at the end of the day, they didn't really move me towards the things I care about because, but they were urgent and I, you know, I felt successful like I was doing things. But so again, coming back to what, what is important and if it's not, and, and again, if it's not a great use of your time, find a way to, to outsource it or have someone else do it. Um, we're going to end on one last question here is Manuel. Is that how you pronounce it? Did I butcher that? In the back? Thanks for this question. Um, we'll start with Ryan and go down kind of as a reflective last question. What is the most common issue, um, what, sorry, what is the most common issue you've seen holding people back from getting what they want? So kind of going back to the beginning of the idea of getting what they want and this kind of, this encompasses a lot of what we've been talking about. So that's why I want to end it here. What's the most common thing or holding people back from getting what they want? Themselves. Um, getting in their own way, making up things about how things should be and sticking to that instead of what they really want, living life based on someone else's rules or standards or to-do list, not being, well, I'll say this, being afraid to take a bold, concrete stand for who they are and what they want. That's, I know someone who struggles to do that when they say, I hope to be an Oscar winner one day, or I, 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 I really, one of my greatest wishes for life is a good beginning of a sentence because that, that really, life is in the language. What you say gives you away, and the way you say it gives you away. So um, the, if you are clear on what you want and who you are, and constantly in the discovery of who you are and what you want, then anything is possible because the only thing there left to be is committed. But if you're not committed, 
don't expect much. Wow. Well, everything that you just said. Um, <laughs> but the, the first word that came to me was fear. Um, so it is coming from yourself. It's not coming from anyone else. Um, and it's, it's really hard to conquer fear. We all have it on some level, and it's okay, and you can embrace it. Um, I read somewhere recently that um, going, getting on a roller coaster, you can either feel two things. You can feel fear or you can feel excitement, and it's the same chemicals going through your body. You just have to switch it in your brain. Am I excited or am I really afraid? And you can apply that to almost anything. Um, you can, I mean, for some people, they can't even cross the street or leave their house. But, you know, you guys have all left your house and you're sitting here, so that's a good step. Like, so Not now, everybody like, figure has left out. their house. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, right, sorry. Some of you are at home. <laughs> so you have to get over the fear of leaving your house first. And then, uh, but, uh, yeah, fear. Um, and I don't know if you can always overcome fear in every situation, but every time I have a block or an obstacle, I realize it's because I'm fearful of something, and it might be completely ridiculous. I mean, fear of a success is something I think that most actors feel a lot, not just a little bit. Um, and if you let that go and you are able to somehow release it, that's, that's how you become successful in whatever endeavor you're, or whatever path you're, you're on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's uh, such a great big question. Um, well, I'm going to go with fear also, and and I'm also going to say that you know we're not in charge of everything, so we have to be kind of kind with ourselves too about that and and forgiving because um, you know things don't always go according to plan, and um, we really can't. Uh, control everything. So I usually go with, you know, we can do 100% of our 50%. And um, and sometimes we can't do 100% because we've got something in the way that we have to break down. And um, to make it even harder for ourselves um, by being tough on ourselves because we're afraid, that's not really so helpful either. So sometimes we have to just be really kind to ourselves and go, yeah, I'm afraid. Let's just stay here for a little while and know that. So, um, yeah, but fear is a big one, you know, and we have our reasons, so. Fear, false evidence appearing real. Oh. Um, everything they said, absolutely. I think what comes up for me as, as sort of related to the question is the things that I find most supportive, not so much in what's holding people back, but in getting to the other side of that then, is being coming from the paradigm of that I am 100% responsible for everything in my life. And it's nobody else's fault that I did or didn't get a job. It's nobody else's fault that this or this didn't happen. And that may or may not be true, like objectively, like at the end, you know, God says this was or wasn't true. I don't know. It may not be true. But for me, it's for sure the most supportive thing is to say that 100% responsibility is on me for everything in my life and that I have choice. Every moment is a choice. Like, I, you don't have to go to work. There are consequences. You don't have to drive the right way in traffic. There are consequences, but you don't have to. And so for me, coming back to like that I'm responsible and that I always, always, always have a choice. And a lot of times when I get stuck or I'm feeling fear, a lot of times it's because I think I've made up that I, I don't have a choice. And so when I come back to saying like, no, you know what, actually I do have a choice, then it gets me back into the land of, enjoying the process and not just getting the goal, which if I could wish one thing for everybody, it's that you're enjoying the process because that's, to me, what it means. Being an actor, for example, to me means going on auditions. It means going to things like this. It means meeting up with my friends and going over scenes. Like, it doesn't, being an actor is not just being on stage at an awards show winning that. Can I add something to that? Um, Fear shows up in many people as a vo f f the fear of experiencing the fear. Uh, one of the things that we like to do is avoid experiencing our experience, especially if it doesn't feel good. So I say, my commitment is stronger than my feelings, however I experience them fully and completely. So rather than avoid being afraid of 
um, not being able to live on my own and, you know, and then stay in a horrible relationship for 20 years, I experienced my experience of the fear of what will happen when we break up, the whole process, all of that, the pain, the sorrow, the guilt, the whatever that is, fully, fully experience it and then let it go. And um, there's a really old quote, and I'm going to just, I'm going to paraphrase it, that goes, um, fear is the best, most consistent compass because it always points at what I should be doing. I think that's a great place to end. Let's give him a hand and say thank you. Thank you all. Again, a reminder on those surveys, thanks for coming. Have a wonderful evening, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, everyone. Give him 100. Thank you.